Thank you so much, Carrie. I appreciate that. Appreciate you all being here today. Uh, as Carrie told you, I'm Dave Kelly. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So this is where I'm coming to you from. Uh, if you came into the, the, the meeting just a couple of moments ago, I was telling how I uh, lived in Indiana for about three years after college, grew up in Wisconsin and went to the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and then moved to Indianapolis because uh, I wanted to get out of the cold and snow of uh, Wisconsin. And after a little time in Indianapolis, I realized Indiana gets winter too. So that's why I ultimately came south to Georgia and have been here for over 30 years now. I've spoken all over the country and I love this uh, opportunity to be here with you. I've been a professional speaker for 16 years and uh, my background includes being involved in student government and other organizations. I was the international president for Circle K International, a collegiate service group that is sponsored by Kiwanis International. So I've got some background in working to try to affect change. And that's our topic here today. And we're gonna be talking about things like advocacy and activism for a period of time. I was the legislative affairs director for the Wisconsin State Student Government Association. Also in the mortgage industry, before I was a speaker, I had the opportunity as the president of a trade association to lobby here in the state of Georgia. So I'm gonna be talking about some different things. Now you might be sitting here thinking, well, I don't really have to lobby legislators. Influencing decision makers is something that many of you probably actually do on a daily basis on your campus. You're possibly going to be doing this in your career. There's going to be situations where you're going to have to try to work with someone who is in a, a position to give you what you want. And so what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is how to, you can certainly use it for, for lobbying, but also how you can hopefully get people who are decision makers to uh, come around to your way of thinking and uh, give you what you want. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into this now. We've got a handout, which you, um, if you RSVP'd, uh, should have been emailed to you. So I invite you to uh, open that up so that you can follow along. Uh, also, it is uh, in the, the chat uh, in a link, so you can get it there. And you are going to find, if you would like to open it up on your phone or a tablet or other device with a camera, you can use this QR code to get it there. If you're watching the recording, you're gonna to want to pause this here and uh, grab that handout. So thank you all so much for being here. Let's move into this topic. And what I wanna talk about here is get uh, a little bit of introductory uh, topic going here, talking about being a positive force for change. And these are ideas and thoughts that I have shared with groups like Kiwanis International. Uh, that is the parent organization of Circle K. I'm a member of that group. And I recently did this program for one of their conferences. So it applies in different areas. But here's what uh, I want to talk about this. And really, this has become something that has really been a pretty big topic for us uh, in recent years, particularly in the past year. So advocacy, it is a political process. Um, it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean, again, that you're particularly involved in politics, but using that term political process to try to influence people, to try and get them to come around to your way of thinking, whether it's political, economic, social systems, Think about nonprofit organizations. They are doing advocacy. My wife and I advocate for the Alzheimer's Association because she has a family member who is uh, stricken with that disease. Uh, I advocate for uh, prostate uh, cancer uh, knowledge and education for men to know that they should get their uh, PSA, which is a blood test. So these are different things. So advocacy can take some different forms and be used in different ways. Now, then when we uh, move to another topic with that is activism. We've got a little uh, squiggle here on the screen and I'm going to stop my share for a second and come back. And I don't know how the squiggle got there, but that should get rid of it. There we go. So uh, what is activism? It's wanting to either promote something, <laughs> to stop something or direct social change. And we might say that a lot of what we've seen in the last year would be considered to be activism. And it can, again, take very different forms. And I wanna talk about doing these things in positive ways to affect change. So what are some of the ways of doing activism? Some are very uh, aggressive, some are very proactive, some are more passive. So let's talk about some different things. And on your handout, you've got space if you'd like to write these down. It's not really a fill-in type of thing. Sit-ins, not very common nowadays, but still, uh, used uh, occasionally. Uh, I remember a few years ago, there was a sit-in in Congress. Uh, some congressional representatives uh, uh, did a sit-in in order to get uh, action on a bill. So they kind of occupied the uh, House chamber. Marches, seen a lot of marches uh, in recent years. Uh, Women's March, March uh, for Our Lives, um, the uh, 
uh, March for Life, those types of different things. So different marches, organized efforts to work towards a different, uh, for some sort of a different perspective, a change, some sort of uh, involvement. Community service, civic engagement is kind of where I fall into things. I'm really an advocate for community service. And so that's something that's really important to me. Civic engagement can be really anything you're doing that you're involved in. Actual lobbying of decision makers, uh, whether it's at a city council level, a state level, a national level, uh, whether it's uh, your administration that you need to lobby or maybe your student government that you wanna lobby for some sort of a change on campus. Rallies, uh, I think a lot of things we've seen in the, the past year would be more equated to being a rally, people coming together to uh, promote uh, different ideas, thoughts, or to protest against certain things. Letter writing, not as maybe as common now because we do everything by email, but actually sending physical letters is a very productive way of doing things. Fundraising, I mentioned some different advocacies like the Alzheimer's Association uh, is a, an advocacy. Music certainly has been an advocacy over the years. I think back to uh, the folk music of the 60s and uh, some of the other music that's happened over the years. So lots of uh, ways of using music and the arts to be able to do advocacy. And I suggest just do, get out and do something. As a Kiwanis member, my club is involved with an at-risk elementary school here in Atlanta. It's called an at-risk elementary school because, uh, called an at-risk elementary school, I just saw something in the chat, uh, because a lot of the kids there are from single parent homes or no parent homes. Uh, some of them are homeless. And when I say a no parent home, that means they're being raised by a grandmother or an aunt, sometimes a sister a si uh, who's uh, older, uh, an adult. So they need our support and we help support them by giving them books, by reading to them, lots of uh, different things that will um, help them in their ways of uh, growing as kids and hopefully then going out and being a positive force for change in the future. So what I want to do now is give you a chance to uh, grade some advocacies from history. Now you've got them on the handouts, you can probably already see them, but don't work in advance. Let's talk about these together. Uh, first of all, the hey, Boston Dave. Tea Party. Yes, ma'am. In the chat, um, somebody missed the advocacy, um, the words for their worksheet. Can you repeat okay. those? Yeah, well, um, let's do this. Actually, I'm gonna give you a moment where you'll be having uh, to work on this activity. I'll go back and grab those words for you. So, all right, um, and we'll see if we, uh, also I can do that at the very end. I can, if you wanna stay a minute after, I can go back. And of course we have the recording, so you'll be able to get it that way too. So, and then we have some people maybe came in after I started. So we'll go back and get some of those key words uh, there at the beginning. So let's talk about the Boston Tea Party. It was considered by a lot of people to be the opening salvo of the American Revolution. If you flip to the back page, uh, last page of your handout, you should have a description here, what I, I put up on the screen as well, that you can read along with. Uh, and it started really because of a tea tax that was imposed by the king in England on all companies except the one that was uh, most favorable to the crown, as they called it. And so people were getting together. Samuel Adams was a, a patriot who was organizing meetings at a place called Faneuil Hall. It still exists. It's kind of a shopping mall now. Uh, and uh, yeah, so he was a leader, not just a great beer, but also a real person in history. And he was trying to do some peaceful things, but uh, the the group uh, got a little bit fired up, and so many of them dressed in the uh, attire of a local Native American tribe went on to the ships and threw tea into the Boston Harbor. Uh, estimates now in today's dollars, over a billion dollars worth of tea was thrown in the harbor that night. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and we're going to do this with a couple of different advocacies, is to give it a grade. A, B, C, D, F, Whatever you think, uh, just like you're the teacher grading history, uh, you can give pluses and minuses. And so if you would take a moment to do that, you can use it on your handout. If you just have a piece of paper, go ahead and note it there. And we're gonna do something else with these grades in just a moment. All right, if you're still thinking about that, you can continue, but let's move on to the next one. The Confederacy. 
Uh, the Confederacy was a movement by Southern states in the United States. Of course, I live in one of them, but I grew up in the North. So it's a very interesting dichotomy to uh, have that, that experience in my life. The states that are in green were all in, fully moved into the Confederate States of America. The ones in the light green were uh, kind of half and half sympathizers, but did not formally join the Confederacy. So uh, that gives you kind of a picture. If you can think back to the United States at that time, uh, the the layout of the land. And it was, uh, of course, over issues related to slavery, states' rights, other things. Uh, also, there was a reaction against the election of President Lincoln. Seven states uh, seceded from the time he was elected to the time he was inaugurated and led to the Civil War where uh, upwards of three quarters of a million people were killed during the course of that war. So I'd like you to think about that with the information I've got here on the screen, as well as anything you know from your own experience or study about the Confederacy and give it a letter grade. Can you please repeat that? Repeat the giving of the letter grade? Or, or my synopsis of it? The end. What did you say at the end? Uh, that uh, the Civil War, I think, the last thing I said was it resulted in upwards of three quarters of a million deaths. So I'm inviting you to grade it either A, anywhere from A to F, like you're a teacher grading a paper. But thinking about the Confederacy as an advocacy or a, a, an activism, what letter grade would you give to it? And get, keep working on that if you're still giving it thought, but I want to be uh, respectful of your time and I do want to go back and get those words for the people who missed those. So in a moment, we'll have a chance to do that. Our third one is the labor movement. And when I talk about the labor movement, I'm talking about unions. Uh, if you think about AFL-CIO or the Teamsters as I have in the one image here, the labor movement was instrumental in giving us many of the types of working conditions that we have today, the 40 hour work week, overtime, child labor laws. Think back at the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century, the early 1900s, children ages 7, 8, 9, 10 were actually working in factories. So laws were put into place to end that. Also safety laws. Uh, the Occupational Safety Hazard Administration came out of efforts by the union movement. So it was very instrumental in those early formative times of the Industrial Revolution to help change the way that we work in this country. But if you look at the chart on the side, in recent years, the membership of unions has dropped. In fact, I'm going to go to the next slide, which will tell you that their biggest area of growth right now is in government workers and teachers. So that's the, the people that they're mostly representing now, as well as people in manufacturing, which has always been traditionally the area that they've worked in. So based on that the write-up that's here, anything that you might know, experiences you might have, Give the labor movement in the United States a letter grade from A to F, and pluses and minuses are allowed. I have a question real quick. These, um, these grades that we're giving them, are we giving them grades based off of how we feel the advocacy actually works, or personal opinion of what we think the advocacy has done for us? You know, it's really, Heather, whatever grade you want to give it based on your own opinion. So this is, this is subjective. There is no right or wrong answer here. And I see some people putting them in the chat. So if you think the labor movement did great stuff, you might want to give it an A or a B. Uh, or if you were like, well, my family had a bad experience, so I'm going to give it a D or an F. Whatever you think, or even going back to the Confederacy, maybe you would want to give it a lower grade for whatever reason. Um, some people will give it higher grades and then they have their reasoning and you're going to get a chance to share a little bit about your reasoning when we go into breakout rooms. So I will give you a chance to share. So it's really whatever your opinion is on that. So good question. Thank you. And the last one is uh, the civil rights movement that I'm going to share with you. Now, does anybody know what that vehicle is that's on the, the screen right now? And if you do, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute really quick.
the bus. <laughs> that's a good no, way. To... I was going to go with the Rosa Parks bus. <laughs> yes, that's a little bit more specific, but uh, <laughs> Alicia, yes, uh, I agree that. And Kirsten, you got it. It is not, as one high school student once asked me, is that the bus that Harriet Tubman used to get the slaves out of the South during the Underground Railroad? Yeah. That was one of the few times I was caught speechless because I really didn't know how to respond to that student. Fortunately, being high school students, the person next to her said, no, no, they didn't have buses back in the Civil War. And I'm like, yeah, that's the right answer. So yes, it is the bus where Harriet, uh, not uh, Harriet, no, I was about to say it, where Rosa Park uh, refused to give up her seat in Montgomery, Alabama, which led to an over a year long boycott of buses by African-Americans in the city of Montgomery. Uh, and ultimately was kind of the beginning of the movement for civil rights in the South. Uh, probably the most prominent person at that time was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There was lots of people who had uh, an influence on the uh, civil rights movement. In fact, such an influence that he had. We have a national holiday in his honor now. Of course, I live in Atlanta, so the influence and uh, uh, of the King Center is very big, and they do a week-long uh, observation of the the holiday here. And actually what they encourage people to do is unlike other holidays where we take it as a day off, they encourage you to make it a day on, to go out and do something, service or civic engagement or something positive uh, for the community. So based on what you know about the civil rights movement, here's a little more information on uh, some of those things we just talked about, the Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act. Give the civil rights movement a letter grade. And Thomas, you're fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and anybody else who just recently got here, I just put a link into the chat uh, to a handout. We are going back and we're actually grading advocacies from history. And if you grab that handout, you can uh, get to a little grid that'll give you a chance to grade them. Plus the images that are on the screen, the write-ups are on the last page of the handout. So you can catch up with us if you just got here. Okay, so we're giving letter grades from A to F. Minuses and pluses are allowed. And now what I wanna ask you to do is give you a chance to Pick your own advocacy. Uh, something that is important to you, something maybe you'd like to advocate on, something maybe you are involved in, and give it a letter grade. And in a moment, we're gonna be going into breakout rooms, so you'll get a chance to share your grades on the previous advocacies, as well as talk about the one that, that you would like to, to bring up. Well, welcome, welcome back. I hope you had a good time over in the alternate universe. Uh, want to give you a chance though, if anybody would like to share about your discussion in the breakout rooms, some of the grades you may have had, any uh, discussions or um, uh, disagreements maybe you had and how you discussed those, I would love to hear it. So feel free to unmute yourself and uh, jump right in. I'd like to say that I was actually really pleased on how my group went. We we mostly discussed about early childhood development and uh, programs about that. And there was a lot of things that I could say that we all agreed upon because there's there could there's a lot of work that needs to be done as well as a lot of things that are beneficial. Mm -hmm. Great, appreciate that, Patrick. Go ahead, if you had something else there. And I, I, I can say I'm, I'm very pleased at how the, the group went as a whole. That's good, that's good, yes. Well, and critical thinking and civil discourse are both um, encouraged and welcomed. So thank you, appreciate that, Patrick. Anybody else wanna share about your breakout room experience? We had a lot of different grades. Yeah. A lot of different grades for the idea. What, right? was some, what was some of the discussion that went around that? Um, we had, uh, since we didn't do it in the order <laughs> that you gave, That's so okay. I was all over. Um, but um, the, what was the one I came in on? The labor union got C through F um, and civil rights A through D. Oh. Um, yes. Um, for me personally, most of them was F's until we got to civil rights because prior to that, it was slavery. <laughs> it was just slavery. Many <laughs> times it was slavery involved, but what we figured out was it just depends on the idea of what, who's going to take that idea and go with it 
all the way, right? right. And it could be negative and positive, but it always ends up being a certain group, right? And so I, you know, that that's scary when many times those groups, many times, not all, but many groups only promote the negative only. Mm. And then when you fight against that as a black female, I'm called rebellious. I'm called like I remember in social studies books, they call um Frederick Douglass a rebellious slave. Like I remember that. That was in the 80s. Mm. I'm like, well, who wants to grow up being a slave? <laughs> <laughs> Like, why would you do that? But because he found a way in order to be like, that's not how I'm supposed to be. Why are you like this? And if you push that, you're rebellious, you're aggressive, you're this, this, and that. And I'm like, shoot, let me just be aggressive and rebellious. I don't care. But, you know, it, it's, it comes a point in time that can, if it was a simple idea, why can't people talk? That's the big issue is talking and not you know, <laughs> so, yeah. No, and I agree, I agree with that. And that's why I've really tried to couch this of, of working to be positive change and that we can have these conversations and that we can learn from each other too. Uh, I did this program for a school in Michigan back in January uh, for their student government. And the student government president said something that I thought was just so uh, prescient was that we need to move from anger to collaboration. And yes, we can be on different sides of issues, but that's why we talk about things. And that's why we have discussions and it's not all one-sided. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So Melissa, I thank you really uh, for sharing that. I appreciate that. Well, um, so maybe y'all gonna be the first one to hear, right? Um, I'm happy and I know it and I'm not clapping my hands cause the mic is sensitive. So um, <laughs> what I will say is one thing with advocacy, um, advocacy happens in the courtroom, literally in a courtroom. Hmm. And the skinny, the skinny, skinny, my twins. So no one knows this story. It's coming out in, the, in about two to three months. But um, real quick, my twins had the signs of COVID-19 January 6th and January 8th of 2020. Um, I had already, I'm a techie, so I was already tracking SARS-CoV-2. And the same breath, and, I, and I'm open to talk about this because it happened. I was actually homeless. We were actually a homeless shelter during that time frame. Um, I had to take them back and forth in the ER, to the ER, to the doctor. By the time, and they were already hybrid e-schooling. So see, you got that? So it's dual things going on at the same time. And I kept telling them, no, this is COVID-19. They were sick for 28 days, really bad. Um, the description is bad, but they would not admit my daughters because no one wanted to admit that it was here since we had to wait until the United States said that it was. Well, approximately two, was about two months, two and a half months later, here is Thursday, March the 12th. We are in trial. We are in trial um, because the court did not want to believe that my daughters had COVID-19 and I had it in February. Wow. As for the whole month, six, six, six. And so I am sitting in this courtroom and I'm like, am I to tell them what I'm doing or what I've done? And, and God's like, no, 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 don't say anything. My daughters were, it, it was, it was a very sexualized statement that 12 year old. Well, the judge said when I was 12 years old, I used to go to school to see boys. That's what you're going to have to deal with sooner rather than later. Literally said that that has nothing to do with their education. Um, and so I'm just like, what? And I still have to be quiet. Fast forward. Sometimes, now, yes, y'all, we got housing. Yeah, like a, a month later, we got the housing. So that was taken care of. But for 36 days, they did not believe us. They had to wait until the news said, hey, there's a young white male that has Miss C way in, in May there that it can still affect children, blah, blah, blah. That was all in between. By the time they were out of school and we stayed in school, kept them in, um, they actually are, are <laughs> testing two to three grades higher. Um, so we don't have that learning dip. We don't understand that because that's not how I operate. By the time June came, and this is where advocacy comes in because many times most people think that all because 
you have to have a title in order to advocate and you do not. So I ended up because I used to, now this is where everybody's going to find out. I used to work with three school districts. I was a parent engagement specialist and on the advisory boards for parents, the court didn't know that. They assumed because I was a single black homeless mother that I don't know anything and I cannot parent my kids. By the time June 1st came, I called Indianapolis, uh, Indiana Department of Education, spoke to their staff lawyer. Um, I would then find out that... Um, uh, I, I told them this is not a suggestion. This is mandatory. This is mandatory. It has to be some set up for parents just in case their students, their families get sick with COVID-19. I'm so happy that on June 24th or 25th of 2020, that's when INDOE set up that protocol on how to deal with different people's families. So sometimes most people don't know you can have people working for you and you don't even know what's coming. It's, it's coming. By that time, that's when everybody's like, oh my God, COVID-19 is here. But ironically, the day that it was announced, um, Thursday, March the 12th, was the same day we were in court three hours later and the whole state shut down. And I'm like, okay, God, this is weird. <laughs> but um, we worked that. And uh, my daughters, I'm very happy. They're, they don't have it anymore. They survived. They have asthma. Um, from mm -hmm. that because it was not properly diagnosed the way it should have been. Um, but I ain't gonna hold no grudge, but I will talk about it when necessary. So sometimes with advocacy, oh, and there's a caveat. When we went in that homeless shelter, it was a, I can't tell her name, there was an Ivy Tech professor that was listening to me telling her, telling another lady what happened to us, what was going on at that time. She was able to move us to another shelter and I did not know that she worked at the shelter we moved to oh, wow. that was able to help. So I'm all about Ivy Tech. You never know what's going on. So, hey, some of us was working for your kids just in case, you know, regardless, even though I was going through that situation. And, you know, just know that advocacy also happens in the court. <laughs> That's true. That's a really good point. Uh, we can give you, I think we need oh, some snaps or some applause, maybe some emojis. So thank you so much for sharing. Wow. Uh, and, and what a great example of everything we're talking about here uh, uh, with advocacy. So I thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and uh, I have nothing to add to that because I'm like, wow, maybe I should let you do the program the rest of the way. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I appreciate again you sharing. Um, let's talk about the next area that uh, I've got, and that's demands. Uh, sometimes when we get into uh, situations where we're advocating we fall into this, ha this I don't know if I want to say a habit, but this um, area of demands. And I want to talk a little bit about demands and what they can, what they do. And, and really in my mind, demands don't leave any room for negotiation. We must have this. Now, the, the, the thing that you know, our goal could be construed as being in demand, yes. But let me give you some examples here and also just talk about a couple of other things here of trying to seek uh, satisfaction, uh, opportunities for resolution, and not overreaching. And using an example from this past year, if you recall the situation in Seattle with the CHOP zone that became, I think, the CHAZ zone, uh, and I don't even remember what, the, that, what that meant, but uh, they had a series of demands. They uh, demanded that uh, the police be defunded, okay? This was to the city council in Seattle. They demanded uh, better housing for uh, people in the city. A couple of other things, and then they got into wanting all prisoners uh, across the country to be released from prison. Okay, Seattle City Council couldn't do anything about that. They wanted all college to be free in the United States. Seattle City Council couldn't do anything about that. And a couple of other things. Well, they overreached. And instead of focusing on the things that they could get and the things that could be granted by those decision makers, it became a morass of all these other things. So when I say don't overreach, what I'm saying is make sure that, not that you shouldn't shoot for the moon for the things you want, but work your way through. And as we talked about before, sometimes you might get a little something here and then down the road, you get a little something there. And ultimately you keep working to where you get the things that you want. And sometimes change takes time. And so be aware of that and think about that. Uh, this is an article from about five years ago about demands uh, that happened on a college campus in Ohio where students 
had a series of demands that they wanted, and there were some things that they wanted, um, African-American studies on campus and some other multicultural things. Great, absolutely. But then they demanded that certain administration uh, members and professors be fired. And not that they had done anything wrong or said anything, but these particular students didn't care for them. Well, that became the whole story. And as the president of the college is saying here, we live in this community with these people, we work with them. Uh, and what's unwritten here is, those people are gonna be here after you're gone. So when you push for something like that, make sure, now again, if somebody has done something that warrants uh, a call for their firing, absolutely. But in this case, it wasn't. And so again, overreaching can get um, you, it, it takes away from your credibility. So keep that in mind. And as we were just talking about civil discourse, and I'm hoping and thinking, and it sounds like that the breakout rooms were pretty civil. So let's engage in that as we're trying to get things done. That's how we get things uh, accomplished. What does it require that we have to respect other people? Uriel, you got your hand up? Yeah, I just want to kind of, um, before we move to civil um, discourse there, is just kind of piggyback on what you're, what, what everybody's really saying on the demands and, and uh, advocacy. I, I serve on a um, uh, board for um, Down syndrome advocacy. And uh, um, we, you know, going along with that, um, when you're dealing with people with advocacy, like we go down to the uh, state house, uh, we were going down every year. Um, something to keep in mind too is uh, try to build relationships. Like, you know, sometimes we, we were going down where where bills weren't really in session or, you know, being written out or voted on and everything. And we would go down and just, just inform um, legislators about certain facts and certain things. And sometimes it's just, um, we would take our, our kids down there that have Down syndromes or friends and just say, this is so-and-so. There's, there's an individual that goes down there, takes her daughter every year to the same um, uh, legislator and they just chat and she's really interested in like, what's going on in your life now? What's important? What challenges are? And she asks all those questions. And um, it's, a, it's a legislator that doesn't always see our ways, but having that relationship and giving them facts and that relationship to show them that um, people are human, just like, and, and they're just like you, you know, everybody's the same. They have the same challenges and similar um, situations. and letting them kind of feel that and experience that um, firsthand with individuals is huge. Um, and those relationships can grow. Um, and you try to find somebody, you know, if you can find somebody that is like, has similar situations somewhere in their life, um, it goes a long way too. They can relate a lot more, um, but definitely be respectful. Um, don't ever make demands. Don't ever, you know, cuss anybody out. Um, sometimes say, um, I respectfully disagree with that, but uh, mm -hmm. I do respect you, you know, and uh, I, yeah. I could go on and on, but great, great points. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, you sharing as well. This has been great. I love it when we get these kinds of conversations going. And uh, these are things that we can all learn from, from each other. Uh, we, when we get into these discussions, as you just mentioned, we don't want to be disrespectful and diminish somebody's moral value. You never know when somebody's playing devil's advocate either. And if you're talking about legislators, sometimes they do that because they really wanna see what you think, where your passion is, is your information valid? You don't really know. Uh, so understand that. Plus, if you wanna have an opportunity to, to maybe influence their thinking on something, you've gotta be respectful and avoid hostility and direct antagonism or trying to overly persuade them. Uh, here's the thing to always remember is that your enemy enemy on one issue could be your friend on another, or your enemy on this point could be your friend on these three points. So going forward in a civil way is important so that you can get that support when it's available. And, and again, not everybody is all things. We get these, we, we kind, of, kind of tend to pigeonhole people into certain categories based on this or that or the other thing. And I don't think, I think very few, few people are really all or nothing types of things. It's kind of like it's very much a gray area with a lot of people on different things so being aware of that try to keep your emotions in check and listen that's a great point I think Uriel was just saying that about listening to other people hearing what they're saying 
and you don't know people's experiences. Melicia just shared an experience that if she hadn't shared it, none of us probably would have known it unless you know her. And that tells us a lot about her and where she's coming from, but you don't know that necessarily about people. And you, you know, look at me, you don't know that I was a free lunch kid, that I grew up in a mobile home in a trailer park. My parents were divorced. These were, th that I was able to go to college because I got grants that were allocated for low income families. So those are things you wouldn't know by looking at me, but that's my experience. And when you talk about the union movement, I've never actually worked in a union environment or anything, but my family all did. And our city went through a horrible strike uh, that, at my father's plant. It lasted for two years. It was on the national news. It really uh, affected my opinion of unions uh, negatively uh, for a long time. And so we don't know people's experiences. So respect that and respect their life experiences that they bring into the conversations. Talk about being a visionary leader, uh, popped all those up there for you so you can catch these fill-ins while I'm talking about them. You see the potential for change and you go after it. You want to, to, to do the things that will get you to the world that you see and that you can possibly make happen. That you move from anger to collaboration, as I shared before. Actually, I got that line from that student government president, and now it's here in the, the PowerPoint. So that shows you sometimes your students have uh, an influence on me as well. Focus on the result, the goal. Uh, and that was, again, something that was said here, but focusing on the goal that we're trying to uh, pursue and engage in critical thinking. It is okay to think and look at things critically. And I can think about, you know, in my lifetime, how opinions I had at one point have changed and been affected by critical thinking, by getting continued input, by research, study. These are all things that we can do. So realize that it is a, we are all a work in progress and so is life. And so if we're trying to get to where we wanna go, these are some of the things we need to do. Now, I know we're getting near the end of our time and I realize some of you might need to, to go and I understand that. There was a request, Carrie, to put the attendance link in the chat. I don't know if you caught that but some people might have to go see if you could pop that again. But I just wanna give you some things to do. Melissa just gave us some really great ones. Uriel just gave us some good ones about dealing with uh, people in courts and legislatures. And some of this will ap uh, apply to lobbying, but it also applies to anytime you're trying to influence a decision maker. So know what your position is and why. Why is this your position? It might be because it's affecting you personally or your family, a family member. Uh, as I mentioned, my wife has a family member with Alzheimer's. Her brother also has Down syndrome. So these are some things that have been that have affected our families. Uh, and my uh, uh, the oldest daughter, her um, half sister, uh, was diagnosed at a very uh, young age with uh, juvenile diabetes, and so her family became big advocates for that. And so these sometimes this is how things happen for us a lot. But here's the thing: arguing with people on the other side, I have found, has really just not been very effective. They have their opinions, their ideas, their constituencies. So learn from them so that you can counter their arguments, have discussions, but all out shouting matches, I really haven't seen that to, to be anything that works really well. So work your side and be respectful of the others. As I just mentioned, your adversary on one side, your enemy on one side uh, issue could be your friend on another. When I was a, a student government lobbyist, in Wisconsin, uh, we were advocating uh, for a number of things. And there was this move to bring collective bargaining uh, to faculty in the state of Wisconsin. And we had by statute, something called shared governance, which gave students an equal say in the functioning and in running of the universities. This applied to the public schools. And that meant that if there was a university committee, for example, that they were maybe seeking a new dean, and there were five faculty and three administration, we got eight students on that committee. So we had equal representation, and we felt that collective bargaining could erode those rights because when you negotiate and you collectively bargain, everything's on the table. And so we worked against that. And we were working against the labor unions, the Teamsters, the AFL-CIO, people like that, groups like that. Well, we won that issue, and they still don't have it in the state of Wisconsin. It still comes up every year but we did fight against that at that time. A couple of weeks later, the state was looking to raise the drinking age from 18 to 19. I was in school a while ago. And this was before the federal mandate. You may or may not know, there is no federal law that says you have to have a 21 year old drinking age, but if you don't, you don't get federal highway funds. That's how that's been imposed nationwide. But at that time it was state by state. 
And so this was a discussion. Of course, students didn't want the drinking age being raised, and we were advocating against it. I was already 21, so I didn't care. But still, I was the lobbyist. I had to advocate for that side. And my predecessor in my position was very passionate about it and wanted to come up and lobby with me at the state capitol. So I said, sure, I'll take all the help I can get. Well, he got there before me that day, and there's kind of an area where all the lobbyists would hang out. And I saw him over joking around with the, the Teamsters guys and the AFL-CIO people. And I called him and I said, Brian, come here. He goes, what? I said, why are you hanging out with them? Those are our enemies. He goes, not on this issue. I said, who do you think represents the Tavern League, the bar owners in the state of Wisconsin? The Teamsters. So you might disagree nine times out of 10. Be respectful and you can get something done on that one by working together. However, if someone on the other side decides to make a fool out of themselves, get out of the way and let them. When I was lobbying in the mortgage business, we had a bill uh, that was very uh, heated uh, between our side and um, representatives and, and people that were members of AARP, so senior citizens, uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and NAACP was on the other side. It was very much a, a very big uh, housing issue. And there were different solutions that people were trying to advocate for. Well, there was a bill that was going to be heard in the state legislature, and we were all there. And right before it was going to be called into session, uh, this uh, young man in front of us started jumping up and just started berating this older legislator, just yelling at him, calling him every name in the book. And after a couple of moments of this, the legislator just went like this, walked up to the front of the room, picked up the gavel, hit the podium and said, this hearing will now come to order. His name was Tom Murphy. He was the Speaker of the House in Georgia and the most powerful man in Georgia politics the last half of the 20th century. He then said, this bone, his bill has been postponed indefinitely and hit his gavel and walked out of the room. Now, truth be told, that bill really wasn't going to go anywhere, but they were at least going to get a hearing. And if you get a hearing, sometimes you change people's minds. But that young man made a fool out of himself and they never got their hearing on that. And understand that just because you don't prevail on an issue doesn't mean your voice wasn't heard. People who have to who make decisions take in a lot of information and sometimes they go away that you wish they didn't. Again, be respectful, take defeat graciously so that you'll be heard the next time. And maybe that time they'll go your way. Or maybe after a while with the decision going this way, they go, oh, that wasn't the way we should have gone. We need to go the way those folks were telling us to go. If you do it in a respectful way, things can come back around to your side. Three things not to do, and then we'll be finished. And I appreciate all your participation today and everything. And I love all the, the comments in the chat. Never lie. Nowadays, we live in a world where we all have a fact checker in our pocket. And so if you're, they're not fact checking you, they may have somebody, an aide standing right behind you with their phone, and they're looking at the person over your shoulder and they're going, so never lie. All you have on your side is integrity. Don't embarrass. Don't threaten. This was already mentioned uh, by both uh, Euro and Melissa. Uh, don't lose your cool with decision makers at any level, campus, family, whatever. They have the power to get you what you want. So don't lose your cool and, and or embarrass them. Try to threaten them. Anything like that. That isn't productive. Uh, you, what you want to do is you want to change people's hearts and minds. And doing this type of thing doesn't do that, nor does calling names. That's never useful. It closes people's minds. It hardens people's hearts. I heard a lot of these names that day in the state legislature in Georgia. And so uh, the ones that are coming up on the screen and more. So these are the things I want to encourage you not to do. Uh, approach these things in a civil way, trying to make positive change. I know we're at our time. Uh, we're going to skip my second uh, session of breakout rooms, but it seems like the ones you had were really good. So I appreciate that. Uh, if at any point you want to reach out and talk about this further or you have questions, feel free to, to do that. I will be sending a link to this recording to Carrie. Uh, oh, actually, I'll be sending you the recording. That's right. We've been doing that. that so she'll have the recording to make uh, available to you so that if you want to go back and watch any part of it, you can do that. Uh, I'm willing to stay here for anybody who might have other questions, but before everybody runs away to the to wherever they got to go, Carrie, do you have any announcements to let everybody, uh, to share with everybody? I do. So real quick, I am going to go ahead and put in um, the link to our YouTube channel. 
Um, this is so you guys know, um, after Dave sends me the link, which is, you know, he's real good about this. It's usually tonight. Then I will upload this to our YouTube channel. And if you want to re hit any of these pieces of this presentation, then you can hit it there on the YouTube channel, uh, probably, uh, after this evening. So, um, that is in the chat, that YouTube channel link. Um, once again, I'm going to go ahead and post, um, the link to the uh, the participation, although I, I've gotten everybody, but about two of you, I believe, um, already logged. So I did send you guys individual chats for those that I did not get logged. Everybody else has been logged for participation, so you don't need to take those extra steps. Um, but it is now time to do our drawing for our winners. So Ooh, I'm gonna go ahead and good. share my screen. We've got, a, oh, I need permission to share. Oh, there, I had to get out. Okay. You should be able to share now because you're a co-host. Okay, so does everybody see a big spinny wheel there? I do. Perfect. Okay, so there was a lot of people here today and I took um, a lot of time in tracking who all was here to make sure that everybody's name gets on there. But we are doing lots of prizes today. A grand prize is a $50 gift card to Walmart. So the winner of the $50 gift card to Walmart is... Kirsten. Awesome, Kirsten. So I have your uh, email address from your participation. I will get that sent out. Um, okay, so I'm going to remove Kirsten from the next because we are next. We're giving away two $25 gift cards to Starbucks. So first winner for that $25 gift card to Starbucks is Rebecca. I have a Rebecca. Let me actually double check here because I have two Rebeccas. Hmm. Okay, let me, let me look at this. It is Rebecca Glonner. All right. <laughs> Yay, Rebecca. All right. I'm going to remove Rebecca Glonner so we can do the second winner for the $25 gift card. All right, Heather is our next winner for the $25 gift card. And once again, those will be emailed directly to you with the uh, email addresses that I have on file from your participation. Um, we have five more that we are going to do. So we're just going to do them all in a row. But I am giving away five books by Mr. Dave Kelly. Uh, his book is Building Leaders Through Service, The Qualities of Visionary Leadership. So I'm going to be sending out five of those books directly to your mail. I will have to email you guys directly to get those mailing addresses so that I can mail those books to you. But we're going to go ahead and draw those five book winners. First winner is Chris Dowse. All right. Next winner is Looks like we have a winner in Gwendolyn. Congratulations. All right. Winner number 3. Is Crystal. All right. Oh, okay. Winner number four. Is Miss Robin. And our last and final winner for the day is Joe Johnson. All right, all you winners um, of the mailing books, I'll be getting, I'll be reaching out to you guys directly to get your addresses. Okay, 
So let me double check this chat. Looks like a lot of congratulations going on here. And that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, once again, I've, I've given the, uh, the link for the, uh, for the participation. I only had two people on there. They did make it into the list, um, but I had two people on there that uh, I was seeking emails from, and I don't believe that I received them. Um, so if you are still on, uh, you want to go ahead and click on that link in the, uh, in the link there in the chat so that you can log your participation. If it's going to let me drop it again. Okay. All right. For everybody else, we want to thank you very much for being here. And, uh, and then I will take a moment after everybody is logged off to, uh, to throw in that, um, that visual part for the communication link, since we won't be able to see the chat. Um, but thank you everybody for being here. We were really pleased. Thank you very much to, uh, to, I'm going to stop my share here. Thank you very much to Dave Kelly. Dave Kelly, we always look forward to working with you. Uh, we will be again uh, with Dave Kelly here in a few weeks. And we've got a little bit of time in between our next presentation, but he will be with us in a few weeks. If anybody would like to drop back through, uh, you are always welcome. I know that we have a lot of people from other campuses, so you can check out Ivy Life um, under the Fort Wayne, uh, the Fort Wayne branch. And we have two more presentations with Mr. Dave Kelly for the remainder of the semester. So you can check those out. And, um, and also both of his presentations are part of our Student Life Leadership Certification um, uh, uh, series that we're doing as well. So um, we will all be seeing Mr. Kelly again, who, uh, mm -hmm. for those of you who are participating in that, uh, in that leadership certification series. So thank you guys again for being here. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again. All right, everybody, thank you for watching our uh, presentation for uh, being the for being the positive force for change as a visionary leader um, presented by Mr. Dave Kelly. Uh, if you're watching this on the video, we do still need to uh, track your participation um, on the video to show uh, and prove that you watched it. Um, so in order to do that, uh, I want you to do one of two things. Uh, that is either take your mobile device and snap this QR code that you're seeing here on the screen. Um, that QR code will link you directly to the link that's listed there, um, the link.ivytech.edu backslash join visionary change. Um, that link you can also type directly into your web browser and it will automatically send you to our um, Ivy Life webpage with a little note that says, Let's see if you can see that there. It will say right here at the bottom, your attendance has been recorded. So that's really all that we need you to do in order to show us that you watched the video in its entirety. And then you can check out, uh, you should receive some some kind of feedback email that is uh, asking you some additional uh, questions about um, your participation in this event. So keep an eye out for that email. You might need to check your clutter folder. Um, but I wanna thank you guys for being here. and. Um, and hopefully you will join us for our next event. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Please email if you have any questions or further comments for me. A thank you slide is gonna pop up here in a moment and you can get my information from there.